Good morning. Good to see everybody on this beautiful Sunday morning. I guess I'm a minute early. Our clock in the back is fast, but that's all right. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 265, if you would, please. 265, let's stand together. We have an anchor that keeps the soul. 265. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife when the strong tides lift and the cables strain will your prayer sisters melissa is here safely returned from alabama i guess is where the house is so praise the lord for her safe return let's ask god's blessing on the services today let's pray dear lord jesus thank you so much for your blessings upon us thank you lord for each one that is here today we're asking your blessing father to be upon the services and upon our hearts as we hear the word of god preached today lord would you help us to be attentive to your word help us to be listening to your holy spirit's leading Father, I pray that you bless everything that we do and say today. May it honor and glorify you. If there's one here today that does not know Christ, Lord, we're asking that you would deal in that heart, that they would turn to you today. Bless Brother Jack as he comes in just a few minutes. Give him uh, power from on high and fill him with your spirit, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' precious name we ask, amen. You may be seated. And turn forward a couple pages to 269. 269. Under his wings. Under his wings. Under his wings I am safely abiding, though the night deepens and tempests are wild. Still I can trust him, I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under Under his 
with me to 504, please. 504. In the sweet by and by. 504. <laughs> There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet. morning. Thank you, Sister Danita, for filling in for Sister Danell. Brother Jack, would you please come and share with us God's Word this morning? Well, good morning. I have some encouraging news. I, uh, well, I don't know if you heard, but um, this would be the last week that I was going to have someone cover for me down there, and um, I was really praying, getting stressed out about what to do. There wasn't any really good options, except go down by myself, which I didn't really think I should do. And a uh, pastor called me down there, He's got a pretty good sized church, probably one of the bigger churches that are national, national churches. And he has a good vision. I, I don't think I've ever met him. I've heard about him and and known about him. And he's the same with me, but um, we never really met. But um, good church, very well recommended. And he's got a real big vision for missions and things. And he's got a couple of um, people who are about to head out to be missionaries. And um, he heard about need for someone to cover for me and um, he wanted to send, send some guys to experiment, practice practice on on my church and some families it could, it seems we didn't hammer out all the details or anything and don't, don't really know how it's all going to work out but it's way better than nothing what I was looking at so that was um, an answer to prayer, I was really grateful to called me I think Thursday I was really really relieved some pressure off of me um, so yeah I don't know how it's all going to work out uh, how long or anything but it's, it's, I'm not beggars can't be choosers <laughs> so um, let's go to the message now Ephesians 4 Ephesians 4 14 
Ephesians 4.14. What is it that defines you? What is it that defines us? Facts or fantasies? Ephesians 4.14. Ephesians 4.14. Ephesians 4.14. And we henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Like he doesn't want us to be fluctuating. No other ones be going all over the place. He says he wants us to, to know our doctrine, to, to, to know what, what we believe in. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I pray that we would all um, be cemented in, in, in truth and not be wavering and not be getting moved around by ideas and what people think and what everyone else is doing but to get doctrine and, and to know what we believe in and, and not be moved around by feelings and, and, and by circumstances. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to do something, all right, before everyone falls asleep on me. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions. Someone here. And then I'm going to ask some questions about the questions, okay? Who should I pick on? Let's pick on Uncle, Uncle David. What's your name? David. David. What's your address? Okay. Um, do you think there will be a civil war in the United States in the coming years? Okay. No, just what you feel. What you. What do you think? Could be. Could be. Um, do you feel like the election was stolen? Oh, All right. So, asked how many questions? Four questions. Which ones were more interesting? Which questions were more interesting? Were the first two really interesting? His name. His address, was that really interesting? No. Everyone's ears kind of peaked up when I asked the other two questions, didn't I? Yeah. They were more exciting, more interesting questions. What, what does David feel? What does he think about, you know? That, those two questions at the beginning were just facts. We all know. Yeah, just facts, those boring facts. But which questions had the most significance? Which ones were most significant? What was more significant? Think about all of the things that are sitting on those first two questions that I asked David. All the things, imagine, all the accounts that he has in his name, all are based on his name being David Bond. All of these, these um, uh, bank accounts, PayPal, PayPal accounts, um, uh, registration, voter registration, uh, insurance, um, marriage certificate, kids' birth certificates, all these things are hinged on that boring question, what's your name? And that boring question, what's your address? So many things. They're very significant questions, weren't they? You know... It really doesn't matter what he thinks about the election or how he feels about, about whether there's going to be a civil war or not. It really doesn't matter. It was interesting, though, but it really didn't matter, did it? What does a judge do when you're in a courtroom, getting there at the trial? The judge would say, how did you feel? on the night of the 15th of March or whatever. How did you feel? What was going through your mind? What were you thinking about? Is that what judges do? Where were you on the 15th of March? What, 
How long were you there? That's what they do, don't they? They want the facts. They don't, want to, they don't care about hearsay. They don't care about what you said to someone else or how you felt. It's where were you? How long were you there? What did you do? Just because what is it that defines us? The facts are what defines us. Not what we feel. Not, not, what, not anything else. It's um, the facts that define us. What's more interesting? A movie? Or like security camera footage, black and white, grainy, can't hardly see what's going on there. What's more interesting to watch, a movie or security camera footage? Unless something really exciting like a bank robbery is in a process or something. Security camera footage really is quite boring. It's just, nope. Oh, that guy walked across there at such and such a time. One time I had my stilts stolen at a job, and they had cameras. And it was really boring trying to figure out. But we eliminated all the other workers until finally there was one worker that picked up my stilts and threw them in his van. But it was really boring, you know, watching, eliminating that guy, eliminating the other guy, eliminating the other guy. It was really boring. You know, it'd be a lot more exciting to watch a movie. But what is it that defined all those other guys as innocent and that one guy as guilty? That boring security camera footage, wasn't it? Because it was a fact. Had the time there and everything. It defined. Def it defines people because it was a fact. What's fiction doesn't define anybody. Most people would rather read a novel. An exciting adventure, some, some mystery, something like that. People would rather, rather um, read a novel rather than a dictionary. Has anyone read a dictionary from cover to cover? I can imagine some people here have done that. Only other person I know have done it is my brother, Mike. He would, my grandma would catch him on candle night, candle light, Reading in a dictionary at nighttime, <laughs> sneaking. <laughs> I just, he has problems. <laughs> but most of us normal people would rather read a novel than a dictionary. But what's going to change us? What a, is a novel going to change us? Novel ain't going to change us. But what would a dictionary would change us, wouldn't it? It starts putting ideas like, oh, that's not how you use that word. Oh, that's what that word means. Hey, no, I, I, now I understand what that guy was saying. And it can change us. Why? Because it's a fact. We, a novel isn't going to change us because we know it's just a story. It's just fiction. It's just a fantasy. A happy story might make you happy for a minute. A sad story might make you sad for a minute. But if you're a happy person... A sad story isn't going to make you sad. And if you're a sad person, a happy story isn't going to make you happy. Did I say that right? So, because what is it that, that defines you? Facts. If you're standing on a fact that makes you happy, you're going to be a happy person. If you're standing on a fact that makes you sad, no matter, no matter how many happy stories, good ending Cinderella stories you read, it's not going to make you happy. Because it's just a story. So um, what is it that defines our language, our English language? You know what defines it? Kind of already gave it away. A dictionary. A dictionary defines our English language. But what, but what defines us humans? What defines us humans? What are the facts that define you and me? What are the facts? What's the fact? A book of facts that defines you and me. Every human. The Bible, very good. The Bible. We are defined by the Bible as obedient, as disobedient, as believing the promises, not believing the promises, re receiving what it says or rejecting what it says. That is what's going to define us. See us in John, John 12, 48. John 12, 48.
John 12, 48. Let's start in 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my what? Words. words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the what? Last day. So who's going to judge us? What is it that's going to define us? is what's going to define you. It's not what you think is going to define you. It's not what you think others think about you that's going to define you. It's not what everybody is doing that's not going to define you. What everyone has been doing in your family for the last hundred years, that's not what's going to define you. What's going to define you in the end? The Bible is what's going to define you. It's, what, it's the facts of what saith the Lord. Did you receive my gift? It's going to be asked upon us. Did you believe my promises, Christians? Did you obey my commands? Look at Luke 9, Luke 9, 26. Luke 9, 26. Nine twenty six, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in the Father's and of the holy angels. That is what's going to define you. What is it that gave Adam life? What is it that gave Adam life when he was just a bunch of clay laying on the ground? God's what? <coughs> what did God do to Adam, you guys? Come on. What did God do to Adam before he was Adam, when he was just a carved out piece of clay on the ground? What did God do to him? Breathed into him. Thank you. Looking for a kid. He breathed into him. There was Adam there, and Adam was just lifeless as can be, and God went, Bible says it was his breath that gave Adam life. And Adam said, oh, good morning, God. I gave him life. The breath of God gave Adam life. And what is it that can give us life? God's words. God's words is what gives us life. It is what gave us life, and it's what's going to define you in the end. So back to the dictionary. Dictionary defines a language the dictionary is written in. Imagine that. You have a dictionary. And it defines the English language, but it's written in what? In English, with English words. A dictionary um, defines a language the dictionary is written in, just like us, in God's word. And what would happen to us if we read a dictionary from cover to cover? What would happen to us? Besides being really bored sometimes. Think your grammar would improve? Your grammar certainly would improve. Think your vocabulary would expand? You think you would use words that you didn't used to use? Yeah, you would use bigger words. And, you know, get this. This is what's kind of cool about it if you did that. You know, you would make other people have to study their dictionaries, because you read a dictionary from cover to cover. Like, what did he say? What does that word mean? And that'd make them have to go to the dictionary to figure out what you were trying to say. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And the same is true about the Bible. This one time I was I used to work in a clinic. I don't know why I used to work in a clinic, but I used to work in a clinic. And um, surrounded by medical books and I think I told this story before here but anyways tell it again and I all I was in Honduras at the time and all these diseases that I'd read about I was sure I had <laughs> and I was a real just 
panicky about, you know, all these, yeah, I think I got that one, yeah, I think I got that one, yeah, I think I got that one. And then I got to this one disease, and it says, it was really ironic how this happened, it says, someone who always studies um, medical books and perceives to have all of the things that he reads about. I'm like, that's me, that's me. What is this horrible disease? It said hypochondriac. <laughs> and I like, what's hypochondriac? And then it dawned on me, I remember I heard that word and what it, you know, someone called someone a hypochondriac, it just all came to me. And it was all very ironic how that happened. Pretty funny, kind of cured me there. All my diseases had a big laugh. Anyways, but just like a dictionary would prove us if we read it from cover to cover because it defines a language and defines what we say, same is true about the Bible. The Bible might not be as interesting as other things, but it's the only thing that will define you. It's the only thing that can change you and change others. See this in 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy 3.15. Second Timothy three fifteen. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee what make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, what's the thing that's going to define you? The Bible. What's the only thing that can change you and others? The Bible. No other stories, no movies, not any of these interesting fantasies are going to change us. What's going to change us is facts. Facts. What the Bible says. What thus saith the Lord. So look in 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, like in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed unto the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. When you read God's word, it compares you. It's like looking in a mirror, and it shows you Jesus, and shows what you know what you're like, and you start trying to see and trying to compare yourself and match yourself to Jesus. That's what God's word does. It makes us if we're Christians, conforms us to the image of Christ. And that's doctrine. It's what God says. It's the facts that we might think are boring, but that's the only thing that will make us change to be like Jesus. Doctrine is what defines you, what will make or break you. We're going to do a little exercise now. To the Sunday school, we do exercises. I feel like I've preached, this, preached something similar to what we're going to do here. You guys remember a message I preached about a solenoid? Solenoid. Remember solenoid? I would really remember that. So, you remember that solenoid message? Like, yeah, I remember that. Man. That was an exciting one. So, it was about how little bits of faith brought on bigger, bigger things of faith. Does it ring a bell? Hmm. I'm pretty sure I preached it here, but maybe I didn't. What would happen if I just start repeating my messages? Everyone forgot them already? All right, so I'm going to mention someone in the Bible who was made or broken by the word of God, and you give me something where they responded to God's word earlier in their life, or how the Bible kind of gives the impression that it was earlier. Um, it doesn't have to be pervadum, just how the verse goes, but more or less. You guys can do it? All right. So the first one we're going to start off is Adam and Eve. All right. So we find Adam and Eve. They're hiding. They just made some, some 
fig um, close. I'm going to read a verse here, and you guys tell me something in the Bible where before this, the word of God came to him. All right. It says, and the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And he said, when I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. All right, before this, give me something where the word of God came unto them, and they did something with those words that God gave them. What's that? They twisted God's words up, yeah. But what it was it that God told them to do before that? Something or God's word came to them before that, told them to do something or not to do something. Don't eat the fruit. So what God's word came to them at that time. What did they do with God's word? They rejected it. And now what's happening? Now God's word came to them again in the cool of the evening, and what are they doing? They're terrified. They're scared because they rejected God's word, and now they're being broken by God's word. All right, let's go to the next one. Adam, make to thee an ark. Make to thee an ark. Give me something where the Bible gives the impression that Adam, that, Adam, that Noah had. Did I say Adam, make thee an ark? That's hilarious. No, make thee an ark. Now give me something where it seems like Noah had been listening to God beforehand. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Very good. Okay, now, where the Lord came unto Abraham and said, Abraham, look in the skies. See all those stars up there? You're going to have more descendants than all those stars up there that you can count. Give me something where the word of God came to Abraham before then and uh, before, something before that. He said, look up in the sky and um, he told him to leave somewhere. Leave thy father. Leave the Ur. Leave Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham obeyed the word of God then and was able to obtain a great big promise, didn't he? Okay, how about this one? We got Moses. Moses standing before God at the, at the uh, burning bush. And Moses says, uh, where God came to Moses and said, hey, I want you to um, go to Pharaoh and bring forth my, my people out of Egypt. Give me something where the Bible gives the idea that Moses responded to God's word beforehand. This was actually in the New Testament. But where Moses obeyed um, what God had said beforehand. You're going to find this one in the New Testament probably. Something in the New Testament. How's it go? So, uh, how, how, yeah. that's what I was looking for. So, Moses, he said, you know what? I'm, what my mama done taught me when I was a little kid, I'm going to receive what, that, what she said, that all these gods here in Egypt are nothing. They're just a bunch of old rocks. And I'm going to just, I'm going to stick to what my mommy done taught me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, 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 keep that, and God reciprocated that and gave him a bigger order, didn't he? And a bigger promise. And he was able to do a great big thing because he obeyed God's word when he was little. Another one like that. The um, Lord spoke unto Joshua. Moses is dead. Get up. Cross over that Jordan. Go into the promised land. Give me something where Joshua had responded to God's word earlier. Why not go to the promised land if God was telling him that's what you're doing? 
But before that, before that, what, something when he was a little kid. Give me something when he was a little kid. You guys remember anything about, about Joshua when he was a little kid? All right, let's look at it. Exodus 33.11. Exodus 33.11. Exodus 33, 11. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh with, unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant, what? Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man departed not out of the tabernacle. Where we find Joshua? When he was a little kid? In church. He was in church. He was listening to God's words from Moses. And he was... He was attentive to those words. And how did God use it later on? God used him, didn't he? He was able to obtain the great big promise of, of taking everyone into the promised land. Why? Because he had been receptive to God's word. God's word went, came to him when he was little, and he received those words. And those words made Joshua. It is what defined him as a great man of God. And you could go through every character in the Bible and do the same thing. Every single one of them. You could see how either they responded to God's word and God used that, or they rejected God's word and were broken by God's word. Let's look at this in Matthew 21, 44. Matthew 21, 44. Matthew 21, 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Remember what's going to judge us on the end? In the end, is it Jesus that's going to judge us? Or the Bible that's going to judge us? Sorry, I forgot. It says, I won't judge you. But my words are going to judge you. And this is what it says here. Everyone who stumbles and comes to their knees and submits to what the Bible says. How's it go? And be broken. But whosoever will, it shall fall. If you refuse to fall before what the Bible says, humble yourselves, what's going to happen? It will grind you to powder. So look in Philippians 2.10. Philippians 2.10. Philippians 2.10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of all things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. If we, we allow the humble ourselves to what the word of God says, it will define us as an obedient person, as someone who, who will obtain life. But if we reject, reject what it says, we are going to be broken come judgment day. The word of God is what's going to define us. Not, not the interesting things that we think is what's interesting, not the fun stuff. You know, a lot of us, we were defined as, oh man, that guy, he, look at him, he, he sure knows how to ski, or he sure has a lot of fun, and he sure does that. And, and we define these people as, you know, they're just having, that is just, just, they really have the life. I have this boring Christian life, and I don't get to do any of the fun stuff, you know. But what's going to define you? Not, not. Not any of the fun stuff is what's going to define it. It's the word of God that's going to define you. What are we submitted to? Fantasy or facts? Let's finish here in James 1.23. James 1.23. James 1.23. Let's 
starting 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the, of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So as the word of God, that defines us. The facts that we might think are boring, that's why it's important, kids, that you, you read your Bibles. Even though you think it's boring, it's what's going to change you and those around you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to be obedient to what your word says and not be forgetful hearers, but to be doers of, of your word and, and to be readers of it so that we know what it says. And, and I ask, Lord, that, that um, we would base our lives off of, of what it says and, and not what everyone else is doing and not of, off what's interesting and fun um, because your words are what's going to give us life, I pray, that, that you would work in each one here. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jack. Let's stand together. Turn to 178. 178. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal, and they glow with a light sublime. The Bible is true. It is what defines our lives. 178. Thank you for that message, Brother Jack. The Bible stands. It is uh, truth. It is what we need to conform our lives to. Amen. We'll take about a 12-minute break and come back together at uh, 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock.